new adventure for me doing one of these presentations. Uh, as Angus and Christian said, I'm Richard. I work in Anne Dunn's Midlands office in Newcastle under Lyne. And today I'm going to be talking about Gramophone Works. Uh, the site's in the northwest of London, just around the Kensal Rise area. Uh, we worked together with a few other companies on this. Uh, the main one was Frames Construction, who were the project managers on the site. You had Studio RHE, who are the main architects, HGS, Permanent Works Designers, and Mel Cross was doing all the scaffolds that we had a lot of involvement in. As you can see, uh, the existing site was an old gramophone works, hence the name gramophone works. Uh, it was constructed in the 30s and there was a couple of lift shafts that went up to the fifth floor. As you can see, the structure only went up to the second floor. I think they were more optimistic that they were going to add a few more levels onto that, but they never quite got around to it. Uh, as it was a gramophone works, there was very, very little tolerance for movement or vibration in the building. So you got these really big columns. Now, as you can see, the mushrooms at the bottom, they go to four meters by four meters to get as little vibration going through this building as possible so that they didn't, so that the gramophone recording process all worked out with no loss of quality. Now, the temporary works that we did on site, there was quite a lot that we actually had to get around to. We did a global stability analysis of the entire structure. And we worked out that the two towers that they had, the five the ones that went up to the fifth floor, weren't actually part of the stability for the main structures. It was those big columns that gave most of the stability and the towers were freestanding for the most part. Uh, for the permanent works design, there was a lot of slab cutting that was required and we had to work through it to make sure all the slab cuts weren't going to destabilize the building at all. Uh, there was a couple of retaining walls. There was one in the basement that was next to a road that runs up the side of the site. And there was one on a towpath next to the canal at the north of the site as well. Uh, we had a couple of working platforms that we had to design so that the piling rig could get around the entire site inside the building and outside of the building. Uh, we had to do a demolition sequence for the entire site so that they could get all the work done without interrupting themselves or taking away props at the wrong time. Uh, there turned out to be a attenuation tank underneath the towpath that I'll talk about in great detail later. And there was a tower crane base to design. Uh, right now, I know everyone's thinking about tower crane bases, but this one's worked out quite well. It's still standing. It's had a lot of bits and bobs to do with it as well. And of course, there was those uh, lift shafts. The south lift shaft needed an uh, extension onto the lift pit at the bottom. Oh, that's the tower crane base. So the cut slab analysis, uh, we used a Amos plate model to try and model it the best way. And then that was checked with a Tecla structural designer on the CAT2 check. Now with the plate model, uh, you can see that we've modeled it with all the cuts in place to see where the main stresses are. That's actually showing you the deflection in the slab, but uh, the other sections of the plate model showed where the stresses were. So what we did is anywhere there was high stress in that model, we put in a set of props and then we just use engineering judgment to see where any other props we need to go on site. Uh, as the construction went along, those props were suitable to allow the loads allow the load to be up to what they needed to when they were building on site. So it was, there was a few loads. If you can see the loads there, you've got different loads on the different slabs. And this is the TSD model that we used to CAT2 check the entire thing. So it was, I was in charge of the CAT2 for this and it was someone in the Southern office 
did the plate model to design the actual props. As you can see, all the slab is working fine there. Uh, there's no problems with it. Green is good, red is bad. You can see there's no red in that model. Uh, for the model, we did not model the towers in it because we had already assessed that they didn't give any stability to the structure. They were just freestanding towers. Uh, the next thing we did is the lovely tower crane bases or a tower crane base, there was just the one of them. Uh, so we designed it, it was, there was a lot of limitations on site. Uh, there was a building right next to the structure and there was, that's a picture of it in place with the tower crane, forgot I was there. Uh, there was a building right next to it and there was the structure that we were working on on the other side of it which had an attenuation tank to fit in in between the building and the edge of the sheet piles there. And you can see there's a tower wrapped in white at the top of that picture as well. Uh, it was about 1.3 meters away from that adjacent building. So it needed to be in place and fully supported so that the foundations of that building weren't disrupted. And of course, it needed to be deeper to allow that attenuation tank to go in above the concrete slab we were putting in. Uh, on the other side of the building, there was a towpath that ran next to the Grand Union Canal. Uh, at the tender stage, we were planning on propping this wall the entire way through it. As you can see, there, were, there was quite a few propping, quite a few props in that design, and you had to sequence it so that you could get, so you could remove that slab and get all the piles in place. What we were doing, as you can see, there, were, there was a lot of piling works to take place along that north side of highlighting green there. Uh, the sequencing was going to get quite complicated to allow the piling rig to get in there and then start doing all the piling with all these props in place. We ended up, if we had done the sequencing, it would have been, the rig would have had to go up twice on the top bit just to get access to all the props. Uh, but in the end, we analysed this wall and we were able to justify that the wall in its current condition was able to support the loads that would be on it from the towpath and from that scaffold you can see at the top of the picture there. Uh, and so when we were able to do it without propping, it made the entire sequence so much easier. And we were just able to get the piling rig up there, localised breakouts to allow the piles to be put in, and then just continue with the work all the way around. Uh, next to the towpath, however, a few months after the work started, a uh, retention tank was found underneath uh, that wall that we were about to prop. Uh, it was conveniently right next to that uh, retaining wall that supports the footpath. And we did not want the Grand Union Canal falling into this site. So this excavation had to be quite sturdy. As you can see, there was a few levels. The main part of this design was the slab at the top. Uh, was, had props going across it so that the slab was still retained. We counted on that slab during our assessment of that retaining wall uh, to give lateral stability to the wall. So those props needed to support that slab and the excavation itself. So that, that was a bit of fun that we had to go through. Uh, now, the most exciting part of this entire thing was the south tower and the lift pit extension. Due to site restrictions, uh, the underpinning was considered too high a risk, so we had to devise an interesting solution uh, to support this tower while the lift pit was dug down an extra 1.8 metres. Uh, 
as you can see, we decided that uh, we were going to devise a temporary work scheme to support the towers through the sides. So you can see two needles going through the side of the tower there. Uh, the two needles were then supported on big uh, UC sections. They went through both sides of that opening in the tower. And then on the south side, it was supported on a primary beam. It was supported on stub columns. And on the north side, it was on two mega shores that went down to the basement slab there. Uh, so in the south elevation, you can see there, the stub columns were supported on the piles that were already in place as part of the permanent works. So that meant there was no temporary piles that needed to be installed. And on the north elevation there, you can see that we've placed the mega shores on top of existing uh, basement floor slabs to give the correct bearing and make sure they were fine there. Uh, if you have a look at it, you can see that one face of the tower also needed to be removed. So we had to take that into account while designing this scheme as well. And uh, you can see that we've got propping going up the face that was partly removed. In the end, the scheme worked quite well. Uh, you can see on the right there on the south elevation that the tower was fully supported. We have dug down underneath it and it's standing quite happily by itself. We did have monitoring on the tower the entire time and the biggest deflection we got at the top of the tower compared to the bottom was about five mil. And on the south tower, you can see that the stub columns are in place with the secondary and primary beams going through the walls there. And you can see two mega shores that are holding up that opening in the tower just to give extra stability. And you can see on the high level, we've got bracing back into the existing structure, uh, two tension ties, one on either side, to make sure that the tower was definitely not going anywhere. The tower was freestanding, but we just wanted to tie it back into the building to make sure that nothing was going to make that tower fall over for any reason. Uh, as you can see from that picture on the left, the site itself was quite busy. You had work and props going on right next to the tower and someone was always working there throughout the works. Uh, I think after that, I'm gonna hand it back to Angus so we can go through the uh, 